Mr. Greg Harden, good to see you today. I'm glad we could finally make this work. I know we had a little little mishap on my end, not your end, on my end. I'm taking responsibility for that one, but I am really honored and glad that you're here and I'm excited about your work. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate this opportunity and I've heard great things about you. Yeah, for, well, first things first, I wanna say congrats. Um, Adam talked to me yesterday. He said that you just hit the New York Times and did you hit Wall Street Journal bestseller list as well? Yes, oddly enough, uh, and, and I'm humbled completely because it's not something that I expected, but it's my team has been outstanding and uh, the response and the reaction to the book uh, exceeded my expectations. Is that right? What, what do you what do you attribute the the growth of the book, the the excitement, the buzz, everything else around the, and the success of the book? What, what would you attribute to that that to if you if it exceeded your expectation and you weren't quite sure if well, it would? It would hit that. Um, you know, I just thought I was going to try to sell a book and I didn't know about all the marketing and all the opportunities to meet people like you and the people like you got, got excited and your people got excited, things like that. I mean, you, the, some of the characters that I've met in the last three weeks would blow your mind. Oh, I bet. <laughs> I bet. I bet you met some fascinating people. What what was the what was the reasoning behind writing the book? I've published two books now and I have my own reasoning, but I'm always curious why authors, especially those like yourself who are ultra successful with their releases, what what drove you to write a book in the first place? Well, uh people have been uh asking me it was sincerity and earnest to write down capture what I taught them uh and 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 it's I'm in the fourth quarter, sir. <laughs> If you like hockey, I'm in the third period. <laughs> Your baseball, we'll, we'll, stick with, the... We'll, we'll stick with quarters. I like quarters. We'll stick with uh, quarters. All right. So um, I really felt a calling uh, to make sure that before I left this planet, I did everything I could to share with people what I've learned working with high-performance individuals. Mm. Because um, I've learned more from them than, than they learned from me just being around the type of people I've been around and, and them being just regular folks. And then they turn into <laughs> goats and mega, mega monsters has been yeah. quite an education. And so I've had uh, uh, people like De Desmond has been bugging me. Desmond Howard has been bugging me for years <laughs> to capture what I taught him. Uh, and so uh, it was during a very interesting time uh, medically speaking, during uh, 2020, when things were shut down, I had nothing but time. <laughs> and, and what was real for me is the title. I think the title sells the book. This title makes sense e even before you pick up the book. <laughs> oh, no doubt. No so, doubt. Which I is mean, stay yeah. sane, but in an insane, but what what's the what's what's the subtitles? Uh, control the controllables or so, something along those lines. I yes. can't remember right offhand. Yeah, uh, 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 you you know, stay sane in an insane world. How to control the controllables? That's and right. Thrive. That's and right. And thrive. That fits in with everything you talk about. Everything that the people who are like minded understand that at some point. It's going to come to you in such a way that you need to be in control of what you can control and stop fantasizing. You can control everybody and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where we get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we start to fret and worry about the things that are beyond our control. It's hard to do because like with me, I, I want to control everything. I don't know. I don't know if you have that personality, but for me, I want to control it all. Even the, th the weather today. I'm like, I don't want it to be rainy. I want it to be sunny. And it's like, okay, well, you don't have any, any say in the matter at all. Yeah. I'm a bonafide U S grade eight choice control freak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I am not alone. <laughs> Do you but, think that high achievers have that same personality trait? I mean, we're talking about Desmond Howard, we're talking about Tom Brady, we're talking about Michael Phelps and hundreds, if not thousands of some of the greatest athletes in multiple sports to ever absolutely. walk, you know, the face of the earth. Do they have the same mentality of like, I want to control everything or do they know how to focus on just what's within their purview? Well, I don't want to generalize, but many of them, <laughs> <laughs> would be labeled uh, uh, the way that you just described it. I mean, think about Michael Jordan. 
Michael Jordan was identified as one of the best ever. And you did not want to be on his team if you were not prepared for him to get in your butt. <laughs> you know? mm, yeah, right. He right. He's notorious for that. Because he was going to control the outcome as best he could. So, I mean, you've seen it everywhere you've been. And, and, and some of the best situations and some of the worst situations you've been in, control freaks were, were there. So is it a, uh, I guess the, the burning question then is the, is the control freak mentality an asset or a liability? It depends on other, if you understand that that's who you are. See, the key is, okay. The phrase today is I want to be the absolute best version of myself, right? Mm -hmm. You've heard it, right. you've said it, sure. we talk about it, but how do you do that? By become the world's greatest expert on one subject. You mm. learning your own strengths and your own weaknesses, what works and what doesn't work. So I know I'm a control freak, so I have to tone that crap down. I deliberately <laughs> and intentionally catch myself. I deliberately and intentionally tap into my humility and, and try to be humble enough to stop thinking it has to be all be about me. That's an art form. And it's something we can coach. And that's what the book pushes. It pushes the whole idea of like, how do you balance out your obsession with being Peter Perfect? Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, if you if you have any any spiritual fitness, you realize that the job is taken. Perfect is not going to be who you're going to be. The job Ryan, is I'm taken. Gonna, I like I'm that. Not, I'm not going to pray to you tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 I like. I never heard it put like that. The job is taken. I, I, there's only one person, right? And yes. I like. I like what you're saying here. That makes sense to me. <laughs> so, with with regards to perfection, though, is that something worth striving towards, or would you suggest that those men who want to be high achievers strive towards something else, or is it just semantics? What would you suggest that somebody who wants to excel at the highest level strive towards if it's not perfection? Ryan, your stock just went up with me. <laughs> I'm serious. That is the question. I I need you to be perfectly okay with not being perfect. Mm. I need you to be so balanced, so cool, so 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 grounded in the skin you're in that you begin to understand the pursuit of perfection is more fun than bubble gum. <laughs> Think about it. What what what, why wouldn't you want to get a hundred on the exam? Why wouldn't exactly. you want to get a perfect 10? Why wouldn't you want to be a marksman that's like dead center all the time? The pursuit of perfection is legit. To think and demand that you must be perfect, they'll kill you. Hmm. And everyone what, around you. What, this is something I get hung up on quite often is if, and you talk about this in your book, you talk about the, the, I think you say that the, the devil on your left shoulder or the demon on your left shoulder and the angel on your right shoulder. I can't remember the terminology you use. And so on, uh, here's, here's my dilemma here in this is on one hand, I hear what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying. And on the other hand, are we creating this internal dialogue when we say to ourselves, I want to be perfect. I know I can't, but I'm going to chase it. Look, and does that create a weird dialogue in our head that creates contention that keeps us from moving forward? It depends on who you are and who you're trying to become. This because remember, the job is already taken. That's not an option, Ryan. You will never be perfect. So I need you to be perfectly okay with not being perfect and understand the concept of harmony. Yin and yang, buddy, that's who we are. You know, we we are order and chaos. We are not just order. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I have whole oh, I... things. I am 360 degrees. Just look at that whole yin and yang phenomenon. You know, there's good in me and there's bad in me. And so my job is to constantly pursue balance and understand how to, how to work with those extremes in my nature. That's who we are. So yes. it's not a false, di you know, when you go to college, you're uh, inundated with false dichotomies. Is it this or is it that? There is no mm -hmm. this or that. It's all of the above.
I like that nod. I like that nod. I'm I'm thinking. I'm uh, the wheels are turning. The wheel. Yes, sir. I've learned. I've learned to slow down a little bit, or at least <laughs> I'm learning to. <laughs> Because your survival and your success is depending on you continuing to learn how to manage your own emotions. But self-mastery is the mission. And that means you trying to be so, so grounded and enjoying being Ryan. Uh, I need you to be so invested in being you that self-love and self-acceptance is what you're pursuing. And self-acceptance means flaws and all. <laughs> I so, dig, I like me, flaws and all. I I know uh, there's there's four A's that you talk about, and you're you're hitting on it. You're you're uh, talking a little bit about it, and we'll get to it. I want to get to it, but I want to talk about the self-acceptance concept because mm. sometimes I think, and and this is a popular culture thing, I, I believe, is that a lot of people with regards to self-acceptance believe that means accept yourself for who you are, or maybe say it this way, accept and become comfortable with a lesser version of who you could be. I think that's the popular narrative, but I don't think that's what you're saying. I don't think that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if uh, I really, really, Ryan, I'll, I'll give it to you straight, because I think you're a straight shooter. I think you can handle it. I was doing a, uh, 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 a lecture to a lacrosse team, you know, the richest little white boys in America. And they were cool. <laughs> Do they have quarters or periods? I don't even know. <laughs> hey, look, all I know is that it was, it, it was a new sport for me. I had to learn and, and train, boom, boom, boom. But these guys were totally invested. They were totally engaged. And I, I was telling him, uh, I introduced them to if by word you're the Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about your mm -hmm. losing theirs and blaming it on you. I introduced them to uh, uh, the serenity prayer, boom, 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 which is control the controllables. God right. grant me the serenity. The you can't write, sure. Come on, son. You all right? So I give this, I mean, we're there. This is our third uh, session and I'm bringing it home. And I said, we've walked. Uh, through a lot of doors. I've introduced you to a lot of things and I introduced you to the four A's. The need for attention, affection, approval, and acceptance. And sometimes, and we talked about it, we defined the terms, and I just want you to be clear that I don't want to confuse you. I really do hope you guys like me. I really hope that you approve of what I've done for you. But if you don't, I'm okay. <laughs> Mm. I'm going to be all right. <laughs> so when we're talking about self-acceptance, we're talking about taking it to a level that I, I accept myself so, so well that I'm even willing to look at the things I need to change. I am so comfortable that I'm willing to look at my weaknesses and stop being intimidated or pretend they don't exist. I'm willing to be honest with myself. That's total acceptance, right? Think about what I'm saying. And I'm saying that even if I'm not perfect, look, God made one creature that has the ability, oh my God, has the ability to wake up one day and decide, today I've decided not to be the same as I was yesterday. Mm. What other creature can do that? Yeah, that con that idea of consciousness doesn't exist anywhere else but us. Come on, man. A lion going to be a lion. A dog going to be a dog. But a human being can decide. I can look at myself honestly. And what I don't like, I can change. Mm. <laughs> That's a major breakthrough when we begin to embrace that. And see, that is something that I have in me that 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 I need to to understand and 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 take stock of and become so talented and so gifted, so invested in developing the best version of myself. I'm willing to develop the skills to do self-assessment, self-evaluation. Self-awareness has to grow and evolve. And that's and we're not talking about. Uh, uh, self-love and self-acceptance with the narcissistic nonsense that we, we, we've seen around us. 
Mm. But we're talking, we're talking about being grounded and solid. How do you become? Uh, well, let me let me back up. I'll say it this way: I've been some, through some real shit <laughs> over the past year. Much of it is my own doing. I'm willing to admit that. Now that's self acceptance. Much of it is my own doing. But how does a guy who's been through the trend in the trenches, been through the been through hell, been through the ringer, as I'm sure you have in in your own ways? I don't look like what I've been through. <laughs> Good for you. I, I sometimes wonder, I'm like, man, I look, I look like <laughs> I've been through some stuff, but how do you begin to come to that realization of self-acceptance? Here's what I'm not good at. I'm, I'm willing to look at my flaws. I'm willing to look at these challenges when what we've done in the past is so evidently clear that we're not the ideal version of ourselves. to, to bring that phrase in. Uh, one thing you talk about is, um, and I can't remember the terminology you use. I wrote it down because I thought it was important. Um, uh, what was it? It's it's in sports. It's not what it, it's what you do, not who you are. Right. That's a game changer. You know, you've been a soldier, right? And you've been a soldier, a real soldier, son. You've been a soldier. You've been a parent. You've been you, you're you're an entrepreneur. You're an author. You're all these things. But who you are is even bigger than each one of those categories. So imagine telling um, a 19 year old um, football player, and that's very popular today, uh, that you've got to decide with or without football your life is going to be amazing mm. if god takes it from you if you worship football god will take it away from you <laughs> he'll find out if, who you are for real false, yeah. are you talking about false idols here if you're worshiping certain things it's like you're, you're done with that it's being a soldier being being a, an athlete being a star you know, you, if you're worshiping any kind of idol, it could backfire. And sometimes if you're 18, 19 years old, you're worshiping the sport and you don't even know that's what you're doing because you believe in the sport. I be, I'm, I'm a football player, among other things. I'm a soldier. I'm a man. I'm a manly man, among other things. You better look and see your whole self and develop your whole self. There are three levels of fitness. <laughs> Mickler, it's three levels of fitness. Physical, mental, and spiritual. And you must develop each one. You must sometimes take time out to push one over the others. Because in my argument, I'm saying that if you cheat in one, the other will, other two will not be fully developed. Doesn't mean it won't be developed, but be fully developed. If you want to be that guy, because you know you physically you've pushed yourself like no other, <laughs> right? You know mentally you you working hard, and you know that you love God with all your heart and soul. But have you developed yourself in that area even more have you been deliberate and intentional of getting better at all three on purpose that's a balancing act that you're pursuing that's worth pursuing take time out for every nine in you take time out to to upgrade your physical You've taken time out to upgrade your mental. I need you to take time out. In your definition, of, you don't have to believe what I believe, but you better believe in something. <laughs> you understand? So yeah. that, that's how I roll. I'm sorry. I get excited about this. No, I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad I can hear the passion in your voice. I am curious how you specifically would recommend, whether it's tactics or strategies for implementing uh, mental and spiritual health. I think the physical health is the simplest. I'm not going to say easiest because there's a lot of work required for Simpler it. Simpler to understand. It is. It's like, you just go to the gym. Just don't eat that hamburger today. Like just do it, do what you already know. You should drink enough water, get enough sleep. Like we, we all know that now, whether we do it, it's a different story. We all do it to varying degrees, but we all know what it is. But I think a lot of us, myself included at times, wonder how to develop 
mental and spiritual strength. I think even the spiritual side, you know, go to church, pray, read the Bible. That's my belief. I know other people have different thoughts, but maybe that's meditation. Um, maybe that's being around other people who believe in a higher power or a higher purpose. But I think the mental thing is where a lot of guys get hung up. Well, think about that for a minute. If I came from another planet and and I said, I heard about this physical health, physical fitness thing. What does that mean? Well, you, of course, say, well, it means your cardiovascular, uh, uh, your uh, endurance, your your strength, your flexibility, um, you know, and you would break it down for me in all these categories. Mm -hmm. But until you say the word recovery time, you're not really breaking it down for me because you have been in show enough shape. And there's been times when you could give a, everything you've got completely spent, take a minute and do it again. Right. We could go, you and I could go out right now and run a hundred yard dash and a minute later, you could do it again. And three months later, I could do it again. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but my recovery time is different than it used to be. But if you understand recovery time, you understand fitness. So what's mental fitness? <laughs> Think about this. In your world, I mean, mental fitness is not just being able to uh, 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 get an IQ <laughs> test. We're talking about in, your, in the real world, you're going to be tested. In the real world, you're going to be heartbroken. You're going to be have to survive grief and loss, disappointment, trials, and tribulations. You will be tested. How fast you recover talks about your mental fitness. Training mm -hmm. yourself to understand, A, how to let go. <laughs> how to not just go through it, but to deliberately grow through it. You admit it. You said you took ownership and responsibility about what has happened in the last year that you have looked at your taking your your looked at your role and what, what you did and didn't do. Are you gonna go through it, be miserable, negative, and depressed? Are you gonna grow through it and learn and evolve and keep growing? Because, bruh, everything that's happened to you is designed by a higher power to set you up to be the guy that you dream of being. It's all you're saying. It's all conspiring for us when you do allow it to happen. The obstacle is the way. That's Ryan Holiday. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the Stoic, right? The Stoics, yeah. Come on, son. It's your, your, your trials and tribulations give you a mission you turn it into part of your mission how am i gonna get better because i really know what i did wrong are you gonna repeat it again and again and again <laughs> probably if you don't self-reflect like you're talking about right i'm just saying opportunity is knocking you can whine and wallow and beat yourself up or you can say, okay, not only because you already are articulating the, the what opens the door. I take full responsibility for the role I played. I am also going to take responsibility for how I'm going to respond and how I'm going to recover and how I'm going to move forward and what I'm going to learn. And I'm going to grow through this, not go through this, because I this is a pattern that I can break. <laughs> I'm uh I'm taking notes as you're doing like I tell the guy I tell the guys I'm the most fortunate person with regards to this podcast because I get to ask the questions I want to ask and then I take notes for myself so I've got like a journal full of notes on everything my guests talk about what you just said that really struck something with me as you said I'm gonna grow through this not go through this that was powerful it's a game changer it's a mindset. We hear the phrase all the time. That's a mindset that you can develop. I'm deliberately and intentionally going to take everything that's happening and not just say I was wrong, 
I say, I ain't gonna, I won't do that again. <laughs> How? And I have to train myself. I've got to deprogram, reprogram my way of thinking and seeing the world in order to make sure that I, if it doesn't work, it ain't going to be because of me. <laughs> mm. Mm. Is this the concept that you're talking about? We we visited earlier, but the concept of that that demon on your left shoulder who's self-sabotaging and, and telling you you're no good and planting these little thoughts in your mind versus the right shoulder that's saying, Hey, you know what? Yeah, you messed up, but you can do this. You're capable. You're strong. You have exactly. the ability to grow from this. Is this the conversation that addresses yeah. in the book? And you are obsessed with trying to get the angel to win. Uh, remember in the cartoons where the, uh, the, the, that, that comes from my memory of, of that a little devil on one shoulder and the little yeah, angel. Sure. And every now and then the angel would take off his halo to go whip the devil's behind. <laughs> right. <laughs> sometimes the devil's, a, well, I'll say this. Sometimes the devil's a little bit more fun, a little bit more appealing. And sometimes we just, I think that kind of sometimes we want to feel like garbage. We like that victim mentality sometimes. Look, and we can change that and upgrade all we're talking about. And we're not saying that you're wrong. See what we, what we end up getting, well, am I right or wrong? No, I'm, and I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I'm saying you get to decide. Mm. Cause I'm going to tell you, man, um, I used to get high. I would be high as a Georgia pine. Right. And like, <laughs> uh, and one day it dawned on me, oh, that was fun. Okay, I think I'll move on. <laughs> not recovering, not just, but it was fun. But now it's it's time to do something else, to move into another realm. So you guys who are getting high with me, let's go on to the next level. And, and it, what? <laughs> the, next, the next level. Well, what you learn from getting high in my book and my experience was that you see that your mind is capable of so much more. Now, is it the drug or is it your mind? So I decided it was my mind <laughs> and the doors were being opened that were in my mind. So I decided I could stay high and never come down. And I can't do that with artificial stimulation. That's how crazy I was. Ryan, that's how crazy I was. I was convinced that, hmm, that's all in my head. Perhaps <laughs> I can be excited and insanely happy without needing artificial stimulation. <laughs> these uh these guys you're with, as you were talking about taking the next level, they were wondering, are you high right now? Exactly. <laughs> I, I so when I became an expert, a so-called expert on alcohol and drugs, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell people that yeah, I figured this stuff out the hard way, <laughs> right? And so I would be giving a lecture to like seventh and eighth graders, and I'd be all giddy, Mick. I'd be all giddy and excited and being me, and they say, "Mr. Harden, you get high, don't you?" <laughs> it would crush me, Ryan. It would break my heart. And then it dawned on me, oh, y'all haven't seen anyone this excited and this happy unless they were high. Mm, said, Look, yeah, right. I said, gang, let me tell you the truth. If I was getting high, I would have taken 10 breaks to maintain this energy. <laughs> I'd have to go to the bathroom a few times. <laughs> this is really me. And they go, wow. I say, I'm like this consistently, 24-7. I don't get, I don't have to, to use artificial aids to assist me. And I don't have to crash and burn when they come down. They go, whoa. So it, it, it it's it, yeah, the devil will convince you that he's more fun, she's more fun, whatever you want to call it. And I'm gonna convince you it's you. It ain't, it, it's not an animated nonsensical devil that's you and if you if you fun you fun well the coach isn't look hockey player i'm i'm falling out of love with hockey i'm thinking about quitting i mean the coach is taking all the fun out of the game so you saying you're not having fun 
you're saying that it's the coach's fault that you're not having fun. Well, I'm afraid it's probably not the coach. Mm. <laughs> Co and I mean, unless you're telling me you're going to let someone's personality steal your joy. Mm. I said, bro, you either, you, either, you either having fun because that's who you are or you getting broke down and worn out because you're preoccupied thinking about what the coach is thinking and what the coach is saying. And if we're talking about learning to control the controllables, I don't care what your, your coach's personality ain't going to decide whether or not you love playing a game. Hockey is a game that you play. And I know it's a radical concept, but it's supposed to be game, play, equal, fun. But you know, but it's hockey, and I said, "Bro, serious, serious business." Yeah. This is a true story. I had a guy that I'm talking about, who is now an amazing NHL player, and he was ready to quit. And I told him, "Bro, I tell you, this is what I want you to do. Now, this is an experiment because I know you're getting ready to quit. So if it doesn't work, it's okay. You're All out." Right. I said, "I want you to go on the ice and practice." I want you to have more fun than anybody on the ice all day. I want you to piss people off. You having such a good time. <laughs> then when you get in the game, I want the opponents hating you because you having so much fun. <laughs> I mean, just try. Well, we started this routine and the, he went to practice and he, I said, you know, and the coach, nobody has, has the power to take this from you. All right. So a couple of weeks goes by. Ryan, this fool had a hat trick. <laughs> going three goals in a game. And one of the, one of the next games he played, of course, he came back a true believer. <laughs> I bet he did. I bet he did. So he decided to stick around, it sounds like. Say, hmm, let's keep working. But, bruh, it's all mindset. So don't get a devil credit for because you know how to get, get drunk and have a good time. You better learn how to have a good time, whether you're drunk or you not drunk. You're supposed to have more fun than any fool in the room. Mm. That's how I roll. <laughs> That's a powerful concept. I actually hear it a lot in the context of uh, men who are dissatisfied at work. And the advice we often give is, well, go all in first. You know, you don't like your job. You don't like your boss. You don't like your work. You don't like whatever. You feel like you're hindered from growth. Like, have you gone all in yet? Have you done everything that you absolutely can do? And if you have, then we can talk about it. But if you haven't, like you need to give that a shot first. Ooh. And what I found is that people don't, when they tend to do that, they don't need to go look for anything anywhere else because they realize they're going to run into the same stuff they have currently because it's not and about the boss or the job. The it's them. same inside with them. Right. A geographical cure doesn't work. Mm. You're taking the same person with you. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you heard about the guy that uh, the family rolled up to the gas station. That's when people used to pump gas for you. And they rolled up and say, you know, uh, we're just moving into this town. And, uh, you know, the town we're leaving, uh, it, it was just horrible. The people were just mean spirited. They, You know, they, they were just jerks and, and, and we hated it. And we're looking for someplace else. And we're we're looking at your town and we're we're hoping that it's a different place. What's this town like? And the gas station attendants there, pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> That's so another, true. Car, another car rides up, and the people say, Hey, we really are excited about being in this town. You know, the town we left was outstanding. It was absolutely, the people were just wonderful. And we hated to leave, but we have to move on. And like, we're just hoping that we can find a place similar to the one we just left. What's this town like? Pretty much the same. That's right. That's right. I actually had a real world experience with that. And I, I moved and I had, when we, when we moved in, I had somebody tell me, Hey, you know, you got to be careful around here. They don't like outsiders. They don't like people coming in and buying up land or property and you're going to get ostracized. And, you know, people are going to kind of wonder about you and look at you a little weird. It may not be as, as welcoming as you'd like. And, I didn't experience any bit of that, not a single bit of that. I experienced hospitable, you know, hospitableness and, 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 and people who were friendly and people who were excited to have a new family there. And it's like, Hmm, because of that, what, 
Well, that's because of what you projected. You and your family, they were they were excited because of y'all. <laughs> and that other yeah. person, that's how they roll. And they were describing his view of the community. Now, bro, people treat you the way you treat yourself. And if they don't, it's their problem, My, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do want to ask maybe more of a sensitive subject along those same lines with regards to even racism. You know, I, 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 I obviously you and I, you know, have a different experience with that. And I'm curious what your take is on that when we hear so much from mainstream media about racism and, and how it's, you know, more divided than it's ever been. And I don't experience that, but I'm not on a different side of the, the table. I'm curious about what your thought is when it comes to that. Uh, you sure you want to open up this door? I, I do. I want to open the door. I want to talk about the real stuff. Right. You got to remember, I'm old as, and so I've been through it on in extremes. I mean, I was a, a, a adolescent in the 60s, mm. the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. I've seen a lot. And so I remember, and if you go, if you want to be entertained, Go check out my TED talk where I talked about, I remember uh, being, everyone recruits you, you know, come on in here and this is, this is how we see the world. And, you know, they recruit you to uh, their politics, they, they, to their way mindset, to the way of seeing other people. And they recruit you to hate and, 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 and prejudice and that they're always recruiting. Sure, I mean, I'm like, I'm all in. It's the 60s and 70s. And the hate that hate made, I could justify it. <laughs> Y'all don't, don't like me? Hell, I don't like you. And I remember clearly and distinctly hating white folks as best I could. And one mm -hmm. day it dawned on me, it's too many damn white folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not enough hate to go around for all these white guys. <laughs> I mean, the hate that hate made consumes you. Mm. So if you hating black folks, you hate yourself. <laughs> and so you have to help people balance it out by beginning to understand that there's good people and there's people that ain't so good everywhere you go. And at some point, you better be clear about who you are and how you roll. And if you and if you really are serious about understanding uh, how to value other people, if you treat me the way you want to be treated, we straight. If you don't like me, I would don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's on you. And so that's where I that's where I am in the world. And like, if, if you want to roll with me, we cool. If you don't, I don't care. Because <laughs> it's your, it's your loss not to know a brother like me. Oh, you, I ain't mad at you. Because <laughs> I got some folks over here just, hey, where's he at? We want to meet him. You understand? And so the isms are just part of life. See, I, I'm going to get in trouble. With all, look, I'm an equal opportunity. <laughs> I'm going to tell, tell white folks what's wrong with them. I'm going to tell black folks what's wrong with them. And it's going to be, oh, this is what's wrong with people. Over and over and over and over and over everywhere you go. The world is like that. Those who got want to keep. Those who ain't got want to get. It ain't that deep. I'm sorry, mm. Ryan. You open up a door. You, mm. it ain't. Nobody <laughs> wants to think it is. If I ain't got fool, I won't. If I got fool, I want to keep. <laughs> and so there has to be a balancing act. Be, until you teach white folks what's in it for them, they'll stay stuck. There's. Well, uh, so, what, do you, what do you mean by that? What's in it for them? What, explain right. that. I was a devout, se devout sexist, devout sexist. <laughs> I worshiped at the altar. Right? And until I could see what was in it for me, why would I change? I had power and control. And until I could see it cost me, until I could see that I'm missing out on something, until white folks begin to see they missing out on something that it costs them. Do you understand what the world is like today? If you don't invest in your own poor and disenfranchised, there's other countries ready to take over. If you really want to compete, 
it seemed to me you'd be invested in all the people you have as your people, as Americans. <laughs> but you get stuck in this media pop culture nonsense and you get trapped into this old ancient art, uh, uh, preoccupation with who's the best and who's, man, please. <laughs> you know, if you look, if you want to be rich, diversify. <laughs> if you yeah. want to be that guy, be that guy comfortable working with any and everybody. Ryan, you know I'm comfortable. The White House, the Dope House, I, hey, bruh. <laughs> I could have raised a, 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 a gang of hillbillies back in the day and take over a county. <laughs> <laughs> and how I learned to work with teams and groups was in my alcohol drug treatment program where 85% were Southern Appalachian region guys who didn't want to be there. They were sent by their boss, they were sent by the court, or they were sent by their spouse. They were not happy campers. So if I had 45 clients doing in my lecture, they were not happy. <laughs> and boy, we had the time of our lives <laughs> because and and then now here's this brother in front of him <laughs> who's got on a tie and got this master's degree talking about this is what we're going to work on. It was not a good, good group dynamic. However, I had the time of my life. I, we had such a great time in my lecture series. These hillbillies would bring their cousins and their brothers and their kids over to my lecture and say, you got to hear this boy. So this, he crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Because I was not talking to them like they were problem people. I was not afraid of them because of where they came from. You understand? I didn't have the time for all that. I'm trying to get somebody to reevaluate their relationship with alcohol and drugs. So you can trip, dip, and slip. You can look at me and, and judge me all you want. But my life is working, fool. <laughs> Good point. Let me help you if you will allow me to. And say, boy, this boy, all right. <laughs> and so that prepared me to work with anybody. So come work with our football team. All right. <laughs> 140 cats playing. I ain't play football. I ain't go to the NFL. What am I going to bring you? But I ain't scared of you. If I ain't scared of these cats, why would I be scared of you? Mm. <laughs> That's an I'm interesting sorry. way to look at it. You know, you've worked with some of the greatest athletes of all time. It's like, yeah, you probably got in their face and told them the reality of the situation too. You know, what's a guy like me going to stand a chance against somebody like, you know, Tom Brady or Michael Phelps, who's achieving at the highest pinnacle of their success. Bruh, I love Michael Phelps. You know why? Michael Phelps was at in my environment because we hired his coach. We don't know. We he's we. I mean, okay, he's worked with Olympians. All right, but we're not really thinking it through, right? So Bob Bowman, one of my favorite coaches of all time, shows up at the university, and I'm the sport administrator for swimming, diving, and water polo. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so. Bob Bowman turns out to be a coachable coach. I know it's an oxymoron, but mm. <laughs> but he was this guy who was hungry. Tell me what works, what doesn't work. Okay. His he brings Michael Phelps with him because they're still training. I'm like, oh, that's Michael Phelps. That's cool. So now Michael Phelps is the volunteer assistant coach for our swim team. Mm. So I see him every day. And we're kicking it. Mike, Bob Bowman, the coach says, you know, could you talk to Mike? Because, you know, right now he's going through some stuff. And I say, if Mike wants to talk to me, tell him that I, I, I'm thrilled to chat with him. But only if he wants, I don't care that you want me to talk to him, coach. If he don't want to talk to me, I don't want to talk to him. Mm. <laughs> so just tell him that, you know, the guy that worked with Tom Brady <laughs> It's fascinated and likes to spend some time with you. You're like, all right. Here's the deal. I treated Michael Phelps like he was a human being. Stars, hell, we got st stars. That... <laughs> you know, 
man, please sit down. What's going on? How you, how you doing? <laughs> I'm sure that was a breath that. of fresh air for a guy like that. Exactly. I cared the, about him as a person. What are these types of uh, high performers? You talk about the, um, the fact that they look a little different than a lot of people. And what are some of those attributes? What are some of those characteristics? In what ways do they look different than the guy who may, may be just as talented or maybe even more so? You take a guy like Tom Brady and where he, where he wound up in the, in, in the overall draft. And, you know, look, look at the pictures. We've all seen the draft pictures. Like, that guy's nothing when it comes to this sport. And yet all of a sudden, you know, we have the greatest football player of all time. I don't even think that's arguable at this point. Uh, what makes a guy like that different? Let's be real clear, and that's a great question. The difference between the, the guys, the peak performers that, that are, we're talking about in the book, and in the book, you'll be introduced to a wide range of peak performers, not all superstars, not all professional athletes, but regular folk who were able to, to harness the lessons that, that I'm teaching in this book. But the distinct difference, and, and, and you'll see it, in chapter two, what makes them different? Not only were they hungry and hungrier than most, and I'm talking about hungry. I'm talking about mad dog hungry. I'm talking about burning uh, a fire in your belly hungry. You understand? Not only were they hungry, they were humble. Mm. <laughs> Think about it. That's the, as soon as you hear hungry and humble, you say, oh, you, you get it, right? As soon as I said it, you can say, whoa. Humble meaning that they were able to surrender their ego long enough to be coachable. They were coachable. They were committed to continuous improvement. They had that extra gear that they could tap into at any time and shift their mind to go to another level. Those are the characteristics. Hungry and humble. Coachable. Committed to continuous improvement. <laughs> and they had that extra gear. That's all in the book. <laughs> Do you think the, so I, I think, I think being, well, I, I question one, a couple of these, but I think being humble and coachable and committed, I think are all learned attributes. I think those are very, not easy, but I think those are very attainable through learning and making decisions. But what about having the extra gear and also being hungry? That seems like it's more innate in somebody than a learned skill, a developed skill. I'm sure it can be harnessed, but it seems like it's innate. For many people, it is, but it's not an either or. Mm. Yeah, Yes, you're right. For many people, it's innate. For some people, they have to develop it over time. And if, they, if, and if a person is hungry and they wanna be hungrier and learn how to use that power, they're coachable. So I always say, I mean, there, there are some champions that were born. We get it. But, bruh, when you look at, look, look, look at your training, there are some cats came in there and you're like, this, is, this guy never be a soldier. And he ended up being one of the best you've ever seen. He trained for it. <laughs> he surrendered his ego. He allowed the brotherhood to transform him. Am I making sense? Yeah, I'm I'm processing that. You're, you're talking about being able to, yeah, allow these types of things to transform. That's humility, right? Allowing these things to transform you, allowing yourself to grow. I think this kind of ties back into what you were talking about with the four needs that we have, which was attention, affection, approval, and acceptance. Yes. I'd like to revisit that because I think initially when I was going through the book, I'm like, oh, okay, well, like those are all externals, right? Because- you can't rely on anybody giving you attention. You can't rely on anybody giving you affection or approval or acceptance. And if you do, you're just setting yourself up for failure. People will give that to you, but if that's what you need to thrive, but then later in the book, you, t you changed the game a little bit and you said self attention, self affection, self approval and self acceptance, uh, which made more sense. It resonated with me more deeply. I'm like, Oh, okay. You need to create that for yourself. I set it up. I set you up. You did. Hey. Teed me yeah. up nicely. 
But, but think about this. I have made a complete fool of myself. Pick one. <laughs> In the quest for attention. Okay, pick two. Okay, all four. I've made a complete fool of myself at, through life trying to achieve getting someone else's attention, affection, approval, or acceptance. I've also been a fantastic shaker and mover, craving attention, affection, approval, and acceptance. Mm. What we discover is that many people end up settling for attention and approval when what we really need want is affection and acceptance. So as long as I'm looking outside of myself, now this is a, a, a manly show, right? Yes, sir. So I, can I be candid and take risk? I, I would love nothing more than for you to be that. Ryan, had, did you hear about the guy that got an STD in his eye? No. You didn't, I mean, sir, you, you didn't hear, hear about that? Mm-mm. He was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I can't use that material in it. <laughs> you can use it here. Okay, the, got, the guys will appreciate that. <laughs> Think about it. You you got it as soon as as soon as you got the joke. You said this idiot. Oh my god, that was so crap. That makes sense. All we're talking about is stop looking for love in all the wrong places. I want your approval. I, I, I crave it, but I'm going to be okay if I don't get it. You've had friends. You've been a friend. You've been one of the, be fr the, one of the best friends anybody could possibly have, except to yourself. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Bruh, you've had friends that were like the greatest person you could be around, but how they treated themselves saddened you. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, you're right. So what we're trying to do is simply open the door for you to consider the next level of self-awareness increases your ability to love yourself unconditionally and accept yourself as is. Accept yourself, flaws and all. That's a game changer. How do you reconcile that with, even if we're looking at, um, well, looking at it from the Christian perspective, Yes. accept yourself flaws and all. We know we're fallen, right? If, if we're going by the Christian doctrine, we know we're fallen. Yeah. We know that we are to strive to, you know, repent and yes. improve ourselves. So how do you do that and also fully accept the reality of your of your sin again we're looking at it through the christian lens okay let's let's stay with the christian lens because what's confusing for us is the whole concept of forgiveness we know that we should forgive others but we struggle mightily at forgiving ourselves for being flawed mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to break through you begin to not only uh, increase your ability to forgive others, but you have to look in the mirror and let go. So when we talk about self-defeating attitudes and behaviors, we have to learn to let go of yesterday, bruh. <laughs> we got to let yesterday be what it was. P-A-S-T, previous action somewhere in time. We've got to let the past be exactly what it is, the past. We got to stop tripping, dipping, and slipping about the future. So we're talking about uh, one is history and, and then the other one is a mystery. So when we're talking about self-awareness and mindfulness, <laughs> we're talking about how do I embrace the here and now, the current truth of who I am and who I want to become. I have to let go of yesterday's baggage. Because we're we you've got a 12-year-old running your life, not you, you, but the universal you. Yes, you know what I'm saying? You got a 12-year-old who's frustrated and angry and disappointed and broken and damaged by what someone else did when they were 12. Now I got a 40-year-old man <laughs> with an adolescent running his life. Mm. I got a I got a 
I got a 16 year old uh, treating women a certain way because of what happened to him when he was 16. <laughs> Bruh, when you can learn to not just forgive others, but to forgive yourself for not being perfect, you just open up doors. That's just my opinion, that which you asked for. <laughs> I do. I could do. be wrong. I no, I value it. I, I don't I don't know if you're wrong. I think too many of us haven't really tried it. <laughs> so I don't know. It ain't if you're easy. Right or wrong. I have to pray. Not only do I pray at night to be forgiven, I had to pray to increase my ability to forgive myself. Because it's hard to forgive you. It's hard to forgive some folk. It's even harder to forgive yourself. Mm. Mick, you know I ain't lying? No, I, I, I know you're right. I think where a lot of guys get hung up, I hear this quite often, and it's this idea that self-attention, self-affection, self-approval, self-acceptance, they get hung up on that, this idea that it's selfish. Like I have to serve my wife, I have to serve my kids, I have to serve my community, I have to serve my business. These are all things we talk about in the podcast and the movement here, which we should be doing, we should be striving for as men. But if I take time for myself to accept myself or to love myself or uh, approve of, of who I am, flaws and all, that's selfish. Yeah. But what you understand different from them is that you just increase your ability to care, to give care, compassion and concern to the people you love and to serve more efficiently because now you have evolved and becoming a man of substance and a man who is grounded and a man who is capable of letting go of yesterday. Because love isn't love till you give it away. And sometimes we're so busy, we think that we're loving somebody and all we're looking for is, okay, uh, if I do this and I love you this way, will you love me that way? No, mm. I need to give because that's who I am. It's in my heart and it's the right thing to do. And this is what I'm going to do to build my, see, if we're talking about staying sane in an insane world, controlling the controllables we're going to go to a space where i am so invested in being the the type of guy i'm capable of becoming all of a sudden everybody benefits because i've shifted i've changed i've grown i've evolved and i'm capable of even more than i thought i was that's where we're going young blood which we're stacking the deck in our favor because if I love my, the more I love myself, the more authentic my love for you will be. I think that's well said. I think where a lot of guys get hung up is this. We talked about it early in the conversation, this idea of false dichotomies. If I'm selfish, then I can't be selfless. Cool. Right. If I'm selfless, which a lot of us have a desire to be, then I can't be selfish. I can't take time but, for me. And that's a yeah, false which, choice. Come on, man. Because you, you have to be selfish in the most positive sense of the word. I, look, let me tell you how I train uh, 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 high performance uh, <clears throat> pro athletes to understand why they shouldn't beat their wife. <laughs> how I teach anybody in corporate or anybody else why they shouldn't beat their wife. Selfish self-interest, idiot. <laughs> hmm. It's in your own best self-interest to not indulge in what you, you may have gotten honestly from your uncles, your cousins, your pals. And I ain't blaming you. I'm saying that if you, I can't get a grown man to change his attitude about women. But if you want to keep this money, <laughs> hmm. if you want your life to work, you will eliminate some of these negatives. You ain't got to do it because I think it's right. And because the world think it's right. You better do if you don't even understand the proper selfish self-interest. So you can take selfish to a, another realm, but most importantly, to be that guy who understands um, positive addiction. What's a positive addiction? Your workout. So we have to be able to understand how words can be shaped in such a way that we can see a higher calling, even when we understand uh, when we use the word self, it's not always leaning towards selfish. 
And if so, I need to turn the selfish into what will make me better. I need to spend time with me. I need to take uh, vacations. I need to be selfish enough to say, I'm taking my wife, my kids on a vacation. And I'm going to cut all this nonsense over here loose. I'll be back. Oh, you're so selfish. <laughs> that I don't think so. <laughs> so you've got to you got to be careful with these words. These words are so dramatic, and we put so much drama mm. around. It. And I need you to be so cool and so clear about who you're trying to to become. That when I say uh, self aware, uh, when I say self discipline, self control. <laughs> Self-mastery, I'm not talking about being selfish. I'm talking about being yourself, your authentic self, a self that is trying to go to the next level of self-mastery. And everyone benefits as you grow and evolve. It's good stuff. It's really good stuff. Greg, I appreciate you taking some time this morning and coming on the podcast. Can you can you let the guys know uh, where to learn more about what you're doing? Obviously, you talk about where to pick up a copy of the book. They can all get a book, which I'd highly recommend, and then let them know where to connect more with you. Look, uh, I know I'm old school. <clears throat> I have a website. <laughs> 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 and I, I mean, I have Twitter accounts and, and Instagram, and I rarely look at them, but I, I, I heard they're on fire right now. But I have contact uh, through my agent, my manager, Shane Salarno, who is the most amazing, insane individual I've ever met in my life. And that's on uh, gregharden.com. The book is available on, on, on Amazon. It's available at Barnes and Noble. It's available on Apple. It's all over the place. And you can find this book uh, in, 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 in all kinds of stores. The independent bookstores are amazing. <laughs> and so in some of these joints, you can walk in and there it is. But right now, um, um, God has a sense of humor and has made me a New York Times bestselling author. Yeah, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, there is so many different categories. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Amazon. Uh, Wall, Wall Street, Street Journal. Yeah. Wall Street Journal. I mean, it's unbelievable how hot the book is right now and how many people are trying to get it uh to their the people they care about and the people they love that's how, you talk about christmas presents make it easy on yourself get them a book <laughs> they say <laughs> well, in the same world well i can see why after going through the book and after talking with you why that's the case greg harden i appreciate you thanks for joining us thanks for imparting some of your wisdom i've taken copious notes here that I'm going to share uh, with some of the guys as well. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I know your heart is in the right place, my brother. And people who are paying attention to you will understand where we're trying to go today with this podcast. Thank you, man.